Hey everyone, Drew Hinton here with Aero Safety, back again to talk more about safety. And so today's topic, we're going to talk about fall protection rescue plans. So this hopefully is something that you will never have to run into, but it's definitely something we're going to have to plan for. Whether you're working in a construction industry, general industry, you're working on a boat, you're working on a construction site, whatever it may be, if you're exposed to falls, you need to have a fall protection rescue plan in place. And so we're going to talk about today, we're going to talk about the different types of rescue plans. We're going to talk about the requirements within OSHA and ANSI and a few other regulatory requirements, and then some best practices on what you can do for your organization. And so whenever you're exposed to a fall, there is a standard within OSHA, 1926-502, requires you to the employer, so you as an organization, to provide a prompt rescue of anybody exposed to, of exposed to a fall. And so now that brings us to the question is, well, what's a prompt rescue? They don't really define it in, in the OSHA regulation, but they do have a couple of letter, letters of interpretation that may help you out. And it's basically what it, it, it boils down to is it's all based on the situation. And we'll discuss a, a little a case study a little bit later for that was posted from NIOSH back in 2012 that provides a, a little bit better time frame. But just strictly focusing on on the OSHA letter of interpretation, I'll post the the link to this down in the in the, the notes section below. But if they come back and somebody asked, you know, what's when does a rescue plan apply within construction if they're not exposed to falls? And that that leads to the first question. So if you if you're using a a fall limiter or some kind of system to prevent you being exposed to that fall, they ask, do you have to have a rescue plan if you're not exposed to a fall? So they're let's say they have a a six foot lanyard is not shock absorbing. It's not an SRL. It's just a straight lanyard, six foot. And that's preventing you from getting to that area where you can make that fall. And so they ask, do I have to have a rescue plan in place if they're not actually technically exposed to that fall? And they came back and said, no, if they're not exposed to the fall, you're not required to have one. But that comes back to the employer, making sure you have the most compatible products and making sure you are actually not exposed to it. So then their second question was, what, what is your rescue plan? What, what defines a prompt to rescue and they they even met within the letter of interpretation they admitted it's not stated within the standard but it's all based on the situation is a person going to be hanging a couple of feet and there's a lot of mobile equipment close by um, or are you working uh, you're a you a, a lineman or somebody that's working most of the time by themselves they're out in remote areas they're working by themselves you know maybe you need to plan, plan for a, a faster rescue in that aspect because there's not going to be somebody close by and so it's really situational based. And so it kind of leaves it kind of leaves it up to the employer, your organization, on figuring out what is the best situation, what's the best rescue plan. And so then we get into the, the issue of what type of rescue plan do I need? So that brings us three options. So your first rescue plan option is going to be a self-rescue. So the person that's exposed to falls, they fall out of the the uh, you know the mobile elevating work platform, they fall out of the scissor lift, they fall off the the landing above that they're working on, whatever it may be, they fall off, they're hanging by their, their harness. And so a self-rescue is when the person will either climb back up in the basket of, of the scissor lift, the area lift, whatever it may be, they can climb back up themselves, or they can climb on a ladder that's close by that maybe they were using, or they can climb onto an adjacent structure and pull themselves up. So self-rescue is pretty, pretty self-explanatory. They can, they can essentially get themselves out of, out of trouble and out of harm's way on their own. Now, the second method of rescue is an assisted rescue. And this means that people at the job site, at the work area, are going to help that person get down. And so you can you can use a lot of different techniques with this. A lot of people, if you ask them, if I went and asked 10 people, you know, if you're going to help this person get down from a when they're hanging from their harness for after a fall, what are you going to do? Well, I'm going to throw a ladder up there. <laughs> if you have a conscious person that's able to talk to you and you get to them fairly quickly and you have a conscious patient, um, you may be able to get them down with a ladder, but if you're using a ground ladder, a, a A-frame ground ladder, it's, it's, let's just be honest, it's going to be difficult. But let's say you have an unconscious patient and you're going to try to get them down with a, an A-frame ground ladder, whatever kind of ladder you're using, it is going to be extremely difficult. You're trying to get dead weight down. And so there's a few other options of assisted rescue. So you can, you can use a ladder. I'm just going to tell you right now, it's going to be very difficult. Or you can use mobile equipment that's close by. So if, if you want to use a, another um, scissor lift or another aerial lift that's close by, you can bring that up there. 
Now, there are requirements within the ANSI A92 standard, which covers mobile elevating work platforms. And so if you're going to be using a, a MUP, a mobile elevating work platform, to perform that rescue, there are some guidelines within, a, within that ANSI A92 standard that tell you how to perform that rescue. And, and what, they, what I mean by how to perform the rescue is, of course, you're going to get the person safe. But how do you position that, that MUP? How do you position that area lift? And they're talk, they'll, they'll point out guidelines on minimizing that horizontal and vertical gaps between the two scissor lifts if you're going to use it that route, making sure you're not going over the rate of capacity of the equipment, even though you're making a rescue, which sometimes means making more than one trip. And so refer to that ANSI A92 standard. Um, I'll, put, I'll put that specific line um, in, the, in the notes below as well, so that we can kind of reference that if you need to. But making sure that you're trained on this. And so now you get to your third option, which is a technical rescue. So now, OK, I can't self-rescue. Uh, maybe we've tried some options out at the site. We can't get the person down. Your third option is a technical rescue. So that involves calling 911, getting the local fire department, the local rescue team to arrive on site and perform rescue that way. And so they're going to perform a high angle rescue, whatever whatever type of rescue it may be, depending on your, your site specific um, location. But you're going to call 911 and get them on site. Now, it doesn't hurt, and it's actually a recommended best practice that even if you're going to do a self rescue or a, an assisted rescue, go ahead and call 911 because you may be running into the issue of suspension trauma. And we'll talk about more, more about that in here in a second. So, once the fire department gets here, they're going to do their thing. Maybe they'll set up a, an aerial ladder truck, maybe they'll set up a, a, a ground ladder, whatever it may be. They're going to perform a, a they're going to come up with a plan of their, their own and figure out what what's best for that type of situation. And so we just talked about the suspension trauma or the suspension trauma syndrome, a lot of different terminology for that. But what that is, is referring to is once you you fall down, you're hanging by your harness is that harness is cutting off circulation to your lower extremities, your legs. And so that, that circulation of blood is reduced. Your blood is getting pulled up, pulled up and, and static within your lower extremities. And it starts producing uh, metabolic byproducts and it starts turning your blood and all your fluids start turning acidic. And so what that does is the, simply from the low perfusion, the low blood flow, it's caused your body to have low blood flow to your heart, low blood flow to your brain. And that causes issues which can eventually lead up to passing out, fainting and death, just depending on how long they're exposed to that suspension trauma. So now it leads us to... Well, What's the time frame? How long, you know, how long do I have to get this person down? Is it five minutes? Is it 30 minutes? Is it an hour? <laughs> Whoever, whatever time frame may be, what, you know, what's the guideline? And again, OSHA does not come out with anything on this. They, they put it back on the employer, on the organization to figure out what's best for that situation. But there are a few studies out there that I want to talk about that will give you an idea of what's a best practice. And so back in 2012, NIOSH published a study and they, they looked at the effects of harness fit on suspension trauma. And what they looked at is, you know, is it improperly fitted leg straps, or, you know, loose leg straps or an improperly fitted harness? Is it male or female, the weight? They looked at all these different factors and how that played into a role of suspension trauma, the severity of that suspension trauma and the mortality rate of it. And so what it comes down to is they, they stated in their, in their conclusion, the results, that in order to have a, uh, a less than 5% mortality rate, so that means you're saving more than 95% of the people. So in order to have a 95% chance of saving the people without having any major issues, you need to have a rescue plan based on a nine minute rescue time. So the time that that person falls down off their work platform, off the ladder, and they're hanging from that, from that full body harness, that starts your timer. And so that NIOSH study says that you need to have a nine minute rescue plan. Now that's just a study based on uh, several different factors, but I'll tell you kind of the industry best practices are three to five minutes. And so what you go by is, again, it's gonna be based on your, your site specific situation. So you need to perform that workplace hazard assessment when you're making the fall protection rescue plan as your part of your worksite assessment, you need to figure out how you're gonna get that, how you're gonna get that person down if something happens. So are you going to rely on that self-rescue, that assisted rescue, that technical rescue? But again, nine minutes is what the NIOSH study says. Kind of the industry best practices, industry best practice is going to be three to five minutes getting that person down. And so now you run into a couple of issues of reflow syndrome. 
So now you're like, okay, I got suspension trauma syndrome. I've got the person hanging in the air. They are, you know, causing issues with the high, the the blood flowing back to the heart, back to their back to their brain. So now what's what is reflow syndrome? So what reflow syndrome is is a situation to now I've been in that vertical position. I've had reduced blood flow that uh, you know the blood has become acidic. That the the blood has produced uh, toxic byproducts from the metabolism. And so what happens is I get that person down. Okay, let's get them down. I've got them on the ground. Let's lay them flat so they can get blood flowing back. That's where your that's where your reflow syndrome comes into play. And so again, we just talked about that blood is turning turning acidic. That blood is turning toxic. It's, it's hypoxic, it means it has low oxygen. And so the me metabolic byproducts of that produces a lot of toxic stuff that's in, within your blood. And so what that does is it can potentially when you lay that person supine, which means you're laying them flat on the ground, you're laying them flat on the ground after they've been exposed to a fall, you can potentially allow all that toxic and acidic blood to rush and surge back to the heart, back to the brain. And what it can do, it can throw your heart into what they call a ventricular fibrillation or V-fib for those familiar with it. So V-fib, some other heart, heart issues can also cause, you know, lethal damage to your lung, your, I'm sorry, your, your liver, your kidney. So a lot of issues from simply laying them back down. So you lay them down, you're like, okay, I've got them safe. Now you're causing another issue. And so that runs into the, the EMS side of things, your EMTs, your paramedics, they're going to take care of that. Well, they should be taking care of that, I should say. Uh, but what, what they're going to have to do is they're going to have to flush them out with fluids to get that, that acidic level of your blood and of your fluids to get that back to your baseline. And so keep that in mind. If you do get a, a, a patient or a, a, you know, a fall victim at your job site and you get them down, Make sure you, you know, sit them in a chair to keep that um, keep that reflow syndrome from occurring. If you have EMS on site, they're going to guide you. Fire department EMS, if they're on site, they're going to guide you on how to how to maneuver that. So once they get them down, they'll tell you, okay, put them on the stretcher. We're going to adjust the stretcher to a certain position, and they'll take it from there. But again, just to be aware of, of one, the suspension trauma syndrome, and then two, the reflow syndrome that can occur after the fact. And so we talked about the time frame again. The NIOSH study says nine minutes is, is the best practice for that. Kind of the industry standard is three to five minutes. So I've asked a lot of EHS professionals um, what their time frame on that is, and they'll tell you about three to five minutes is kind of the guideline. And so now you get into what are some other ways I can mitigate this problem? And so they make several manufacturers will make uh, suspension trauma straps. And what they are is there's there's some out there from DBI and Miller. And there's a lot of different uh, different brands that make these. But the suspension trauma straps, what they'll do is they'll have they'll attach to your harness. And that way, if you fall, you're exposed to a fall, you're hanging from your harness. You can drop down these suspension trauma straps. Some of them, you, some of them will require you to loop those straps together. Some of them will require you to um, simply put one out on each side. But what they'll do is allow you to put your feet in these straps and use it to push your to pump your legs up. And what that's doing is that's creating allowing you to have more blood flow throughout your lower extremities and it's reducing that that potential for not only the suspension trauma but the suspension trauma syndrome but also the reflow syndrome afterwards because you're hopefully preventing some of that um, acidosis and that um, that hypoxia from occurring within your within your legs and so if you have those I think I think it's a great addition they are to me they're fairly inexpensive you can get a pair of depending on which which one you go, which manufacturer you go with, they run around 20 to $30 a pair, you know, for a harness, per harness. And so I think that for me is a, a well worth expense to save a life, potentially save a life. And so my recommendation is put one of those on every single harness. If you have a harness that you're going to be wearing, my recommendation is to have a pair of, a set of suspension trauma straps on there and then train your employees on that. And so not only you have to train people on your suspension trauma straps, you also have to train them on the on the rescue procedures. So if you're gonna if you're gonna plan on your employees performing that rescue, then we got we have to train on that. And so I'm not sure how many of you have actually performed a rescue for somebody that's actually fallen off of a elevated work platform and they're hanging from a suspension from their fall or fall, fall protection harness. But it's pretty difficult. Um, if you've never done it, it's definitely something that you should try. Uh, with caution, make sure you take all the proper precautions for that as far as eliminating any excess of time. Make sure you have standard guidelines in place. But if you can practice it in a safe manner, 
if you have a, a mannequin, a, a dummy that you want to put up there, and no, I'm not referring to dummies in the workplace. <laughs> I'm referring to actual hard plastic mannequins that you can train with. But if you can do that, put them up in a, a fall protection harness, have them hanging from a, a you know an area lift or a scissor lift, whatever it may be, have them hanging up there so that it's, it's simulating a a unconscious patient, which is worst case scenario. Have your people go up there and try to perform a rescue. It's a lot more difficult than you might think. And if you think three to five minutes is plenty of time, I'm going to go up there and grab the person, we'll get them down and put them in the chair or whatever it may be. It's going to take a lot longer than you think. Now, so this is where us practicing beforehand, being proactive, taking those those proactive steps before the situation even occurs and practicing this. Like I said, throw a mannequin up there, let them hang from a harness, try it with, let the people try it with a ladder. Say, hey, go up there and get this 160 pound mannequin, which is, you know, an average person. Check out this 160 pound mannequin. Try to get them down using a ladder. If you think you're going to use an A-frame ladder and get a person down, go ahead and try it with this mannequin and see how difficult it is. Then try it with, if you have scissor lifts close by or an aerial lift, try it that way. And again, follow your ANSI A92 standard recommendations on minimizing that gap between the two aerial lifts. So if the person using it, that person that fell was off of an aerial lift and you're bringing another aerial lift in there, making sure you're minimizing that gap. So there's not a chance for them falling in, in between that gap and you're, you're helping yourself out, but not having to pull as far. And so again, three to five minutes of best practice by the industry, NIOSH study, which I'll post in the show note and the notes here below, we're going to be nine minutes uh, rescue time but you need to have a rescue plan. So do your worksite assessment. If you know you're exposed to falls, include in that assessment, a fall protection plan, a rescue plan, figure out how you're gonna get that person down. If you're in a, a rural area, somewhere that's not close by to a, a fully staffed fire department or rescue team, make sure you have that in place. Make sure you know what your available resources are and make sure you know what you're gonna be able to rely on if a situation occurs. Again, hopefully you don't have to, uh, but again, I'll post a lot of those links that was just mentioned. I'll post those in the notes below. If you have questions, feel free to reach out to me. Again, visit our, our website, www.aerosafetyus.com. I'll be glad to help out any way that I can. Thanks again. Have a great day.